Uh, my, my next talk is at 7.30. Uh, so I'm not going to talk very much about our science. Uh, that will be in the next talk. So if you want to see that, just join me when I dash out of here. Um, we are interested in the nervous system, and we're trying to attack the, 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 the issue of the complexity of the nervous system, try to understand how the nervous system develops and, and, and how it functions by using single cell uh, technologies. Uh, and this is just a beautiful drawing that's about 100 years old of uh, what you can expect to see in the brain, which is uh, neurons in black, uh, various forms of glia and uh, immune cells in green, and then the vessels in, in red and blue, which, compo which are, of course, composed of cells. Uh, and uh, we, um, you know, several years ago now, came up with this uh, idea to, to use a very straightforward strategy to, to analyze complex tissues. You take cells out at random. We don't like to select cells. We just take everything. Uh, you do single cell RNA-seq on it, and then in the computer you cluster this uh, data to discover cell types. And uh, initially it wasn't really obvious that it was going to work, but it actually works beautifully. Um, and we worked on all of these uh, uh, various steps here to, to make a nice uh, uh, workflow. Uh, here's a, a paper we published last year where we applied this uh, idea to, to the cortex and hippocampus. We isolated single cells, uh, we ran them one by one on the fluidime C1 system, or actually then in batches of 96, um, sequenced them, and in the end we had about 3,000 cells that we could cluster and uh, discover 47 molecularly defined uh, uh, types of cells in these tissues. Uh, so this is extremely powerful. This was a lot of work. Uh, it's probably five, six months of, of doing this thing over and over again, because uh, you can only get about 45 or so cells per chip, for 45 good cells per chip um, at the time on this instrument. Um, here again is what you would expect from such an experiment. You would find a lot of vari uh, various forms of, of neurons, um, excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, uh, vessels that are composed of endothelial cells and pericytes, and then the glia cells, astrocytes, micro microglia, oligodendrocytes, and the ependymal cells. This is what the data looks like. Um, you have 3,000 cells by 5,000 genes, and this is a heat map showing gene expression. So this is the type of data that we work with um, uh, all the time. And um, it's, a, it's a very complex data set, but basically what you do is you go in here and check you know, what are these genes, and you figure out uh, using the, 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 the genes and, and a lot of reading of literature, uh, what are all the different clusters that, that you see here. And, and this is what we came up with in, in that paper, basically showing that we can uh, rediscover all the major cell types. And the real power is that you can then dive in and you see there's a lot of heterogeneity within the, the major neuron classes. And, and, and in, there, in, in those classes, we were able to define um, all the major uh, excitatory and, and inhibitory uh, neurons. Um, Anyway, so the way we go about it uh, generally is that we, uh, as I said, we, we look at, um, we just let the data tell us what it is by clustering it, and, and we obtain these, uh, these clusters here. Here I have these uh, nine major clusters of cells in a Tisney plot. And only then do we go in and look at markers uh, that, that have some known function. Uh, so here are examples of markers that tell us what all these clusters are. For instance, Thai1 is a neuron marker, so it tells us that all of these cells are neurons. And, and GAD1 is the enzyme that makes GABA the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, so therefore, these are the inhibitory neurons, and so on and so forth. That's just a little bit of background. Um, we've been working with uh, uh, Srini and his team uh, 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 and uh, applying the ICEL-8 uh, system uh, to this uh, 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 challenge. Uh, this is our setup in our lab. Um, this is the dispenser, this is the microscope. Uh, it's really on the same bench. I don't know why we cut out about 10 centimeters here in between, but it's really just next to each other. Um, uh, yeah, as Srini showed, it's a, it's a 5,000 well chip. Um, and uh, ideally, you could get uh, 1,900 cells uh, in the system. But of course, you have not only cells in your suspensions, you have debris and you have all kinds of junk. So uh, you could expect maybe to get 1,000 cells if you work with primary uh, cell suspensions. Um, we're pretty happy with the, with the instrument. Uh, uh, it's easy to operate. Uh, the throughput is, of course, a great uh, uh, advantage. Uh, uh, we like that you can do imaging and positive cell selection, uh, meaning that you can actually decide which cells you want to work with. 
Um, this is the same as we have been doing on the fluid IMC1 system, and for us it's really important because then we don't have to sequence uh, all the junk. And, and uh, sequencing is getting to be the major cost of single cell analysis, so that's a really important feature. Um, and it, it's convenient because, of course, the, the chips are pre-barcoded, so once you have um, done the RT step, you just pull everything and you have only one library to prepare. So, um, the first experiments that we've done, um, uh, that I'm going to show you data from here today, is the uh, one cell line, U U293, and then two cortex samples. So these samples were prepared in exactly the same way as we did for the, 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 the published paper. Um, these are uh, single cell suspensions that are taken fresh out of mice and used immediately, so they're not frozen or anything. Um, in these experiments, uh, so these are three different chips, and we got this number of cells uh, after first imaging and, and being quite selective, uh, uh, trying to get rid of debris and, and things like that, and doublets, of course. And they're also selected to have a thousand molecules of mRNA uh, per cell in, in the sequencing data. So, so these are the numbers that we actually work with them. Uh, for some reason, we run each of these on uh, two lanes on HiSeq. Uh, I think we probably underloaded them a bit uh, because we got much fewer reads than you can get on a HiSeq. So, so these are the total read counts for each of these uh, experiments, uh, and these are the number of reads per cell. Um, in the Cortex paper that we published, we had about a million reads per cell. And of course, you can work with much fewer reads per cell, uh, depending on your question. But if you really want to have uh, high resolution in, in uh, subtypes of cells, I think it's still necessary to get towards half a million or a million. Uh, this is what our cell suspensions look like. I'm just showing you this to, to show you the challenge. Um, it's not easy to know what here is a cell and what is, uh, what is, what is debris. Uh, so we would, of course, select these beautiful cells. Um, this might be an endothelial cell, cell. They usually look like little bananas. This might be junk, or it might be a very small glia cell. We don't know. So um, this is just how, how you have to, what you have to work with when you work with primary cells. In these experiments, we were quite selective. Um, so I think we undersampled the glia cells a little bit. Um, this shows, uh, this is a plot of, on the vertical axis, the, the number of detected molecules, so UMI counts per, per cell, um, as a function of a uh, number of mapped reads. So you can see that we probably haven't saturated these, these libraries, so you can sequence more and get more molecules per cell. Uh, there's still a slope to it. And uh, there's also quite a lot of variation. So there, there's actually a very large number of lines here, of course, because the total number is of, of cell, cells is very large. So these few up here are, are a bit of outliers. It's possible that these guys up here represent doublets or a, or a piece of debris that we didn't select away. It's possible. Um, mapping these uh, reads to the genome, it looks very good. Uh, we get uh, um, Almost all of the reads map to exons in the sense orientation, as you would expect. Uh, a few map to splice junctions in the sense orientation, again, as you would expect. Uh, some reads map downstream of genes, defined as the one kilobase downstream of the annotated poly-A site. This is very normal. It happens all the time. It's because the, the gene annotations in the databases aren't very good. Um, not much app maps to the upstream region. This is because we have uh, actually re-annotated our upstream regions based on all of our uh, fluidime data. And there's only a little that maps to introns. Um, the 5 prime, 3 prime distribution is uh, more or less what you would expect. So this is the 3 prime protocol, as you, uh, as you probably know. So you would expect reads to, to uh, bunch up towards the 3 prime end. Uh, so these graphs show for genes of different lengths the distribution from 5 prime here to 3 prime here. So all the genes are sort of stretched to this interval. This is just a percentage distance from the 5 prime. Um, so very short genes, of course, since they are very short, the reads map sort of in the middle. And, and very long reads, they map towards the end. But actually, it's a, about the same distance from the 3 prime end, probably. Um, the number of detected molecules uh, is also pretty good. Uh, if you look at the cell line here, uh, which happened to be, be the deepest sequence, so at, at half a million reads per cell, 
we get from 10,000 to a bit more than 100,000 uh, UMIs per cell. This is actually very good. Um, uh, I say based on my experience with the brain, so I have no idea how many uh, molecules you're supposed to have in unit 293 cells, of course, but uh, these cells are probably large and juicy. Uh, in the cortex samples, uh, we had a bit fewer reads, um, and, and let's take this one over here. We have 300,000 reads. See a sort of similar number of molecules per cell. It's, it's shifted towards a bit lower numbers. Uh, but uh, we would expect to have around 20,000 or 30,000 UMIs per cell, and this is more or less what we're getting. So this is very good. Uh, we like to look at the noise characteristics, uh, and this is also a way of selecting genes that are informative in your data. And the way we do it is by plotting the, the mean expression across all cells uh, versus the CV, the standard deviation divided by the mean, on a log-log scale. And if you have very good uh, molecule counting data, and if you have no uh, variation whatsoever except just the variation you get from putting molecules at random in wells, then you would get this linear relationship. This is the Poisson uh, distribution. And if you have very noisy data or if there are other problems, then you will have a lot of dots that are off this diagonal up here or sometimes down here. So this is an example of a very good uh, uh, CV versus mean plot. It shows that there are almost no genes that are really highly variable. And, and this is from the cell line, so you're not, you don't expect to have a lot of heterogeneity there, right? There's a few genes here, but that's all. Uh, you can also look at the, uh, a TISNI plot to look at the distribution of cells. And again, plotting the U293 cells, there is absolutely no structure in these cells. They're all exactly the same, uh, which I think uh, more or less makes sense. This is uh, selecting, uh, I think, 500 genes, the, the most vi variable 500 genes from the previous plot. Uh, on the other hand, if you plot the the cortex cells uh, in the same way, then you get a lot of structure. So each of these plots are, have the same layout. These are TISNI plots of uh, all the cortex cells pulled together from the two chips. And up here, I'm showing uh, actin expression. So actin is, of course, expressed everywhere. Uh, but here, I'm showing a marker of neurons, that means two. And you see these are neurons, and, and maybe these are neurons as well. Um, and in contrast, PLP1, which is an excellent oligodendrocyte marker, uh, is shown down here. So clearly we have a separation of, of neurons and we have oligodendrocytes down here. And so on and so forth. So cloudin 5 are endothelial cells, uh, aquaporin 4 are astrocytes, and GAD1 um, are, are the interneurons. Um, so uh, at the sort of top-level analysis, the, this data set more or less recapitulates the, the analysis that we did by Fluidime last year. Um, although we have to make much more detailed analysis to see if we can reconstruct all the uh, more detailed cell types. That would require um, much more work. Um, we did identify some sort of batch effect. So uh, you probably noticed it in the previous slide that, for instance, uh, let's go back. Um, the oligodendrocytes here seem to separate into several islands. And if you look at these islands, you see that they come systematically from one or the other chip. And the same with the neurons. So you have the, the neurons from, from chip one here and the neurons from chip two here, or actually the other way around. And this seems to correspond also to the total mRNA counts. And I think this is... Uh, um, at least to a large extent, uh, an effect of the very different uh, sequencing depths. So one, one chip here was sequenced to 370,000 reads per cell, the other one to 100 and something uh, reads per cell. And, uh, and, and all these clustering methods are very sensitive to the total number of molecules that you detect. So you need to sequence to saturation in order to get rid of batch effects uh, when you're using UMIs. Um, one question that always comes up is the question of doublets, so I've tried to estimate it here. Of course, all these cells come from the same species, so we cannot do a, a real analysis of the technical doublet rate. Uh, but we can make the assumption that, uh, that neurons and oligodendrocytes, uh, uh, there should be markers that are very clean markers of these cell types. And we, we know that there are some markers that are really clean markers. So statmin2 is, is a very clean neuronal marker, and PLP1 is a very clean oligodendrocyte marker. 
And this is a log-log plot of statmin2 and plp1. And you see you have a lot of cells that express statmin2 and, and not plp1, and vice versa. Here are the plp1 cells uh, um, that don't express statmin2. Uh, and then there are some uh, cells that seem to express both markers. Um, if I put the, the lines like this, and remember that this is a log-log scale, so there's a huge difference between these cells here and these cells here. Right, you can actually count. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, so then I come up with a doublet rate of about 3.6%. And this is, of course, um, the sum of whatever is the technical doublet rate and uh, our inability to perfectly separate uh, neurons and oligodendrocytes. So in the brain, oligodendrocytes are actually wrapped around the axons of neurons, so it's not easy to separate them. And there will be some cells that are just... They probably look exactly like a single cell, but they're actually two cells. So um, uh, my first impressions are that the, the data we get here looks on par with, with other methods that we worked on. Um, we can rediscover the main cortical cell types that, that we're used to, and we can use the same markers and see the same things. Uh, the throughput is much, much higher than what we have been uh, used to before. This was a a single experiment, or actually two chips that more or less uh, recreated what took us several months to do last year. Um, so next year, I guess we'll do the whole brain in one chip. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to prep a lot of cells, but uh, you still need to sequence them. I think that's one of the take-home messages. So can't get around the fact that each cell needs to be sequenced to saturation to get good data. And I want to thank especially uh, uh, Srini and the Wefugen team and uh, uh, Hanna in my lab who did all the work uh, together with Amit and uh, Peter who did the bioinformatics. And then I'm done. Thanks.